Adobe Lightroom is a super powerful photo editing suite. In fact, it's my software of choice. What you will realize, the more courses you study, the more Lightroom videos you watch on YouTube, the more you play with the software itself, what you'll notice is there are lots and lots of ways of getting from A to B. There's no right way, there's no wrong way. There are quicker ways and slower ways. In my view, there's more effective ways and less effective ways, but there's no right and wrong. In this video, I'm gonna share with you seven tips, and those tips are designed to help you speed up your editing. More importantly than that, unless you're a pro on a clock, the tips are designed to help you be more effective in creating the image that you're trying to create. Let's get started. Here we are in the develop module of Adobe Lightroom, an image from the Drakensberg Mountains here in South Africa. The first tip, tip number one, is accurate sky selections. Now we all know that for landscape photography in particular, getting the sky right is really critical to the overall image. So accurately selecting the sky when masking is really important. So we'll jump up to masks and Adobe helpfully gives us a select sky option. When we select that, you will see that the selection is pretty good at face value. But if you zoom in, you will notice that the algorithm has been unable to differentiate between the sky and parts of the background, parts of the mountain. And that's not ideal for what we want. So we need to subtract from that mask. So we click on subtract and the temptation is to jump down to brush and start manually removing the components of the mask that we don't need. Well, actually, tip number one is to reselect the sky as a subtraction. It seems counterintuitive, but let's see. When you do that, you'll notice that the subtraction is much more accurate in its selection than the original mask itself. And what's been left here are all of the components that we didn't want selected in the first place. So if we invert that subtraction, then you are left with a really clear and clean and accurate selection of the sky, which means you can then start editing those components. So we'll do a very quick and dirty edit, um, just to give you the idea. And there we have. So a quick before and after, before selecting the sky and editing, and there's after we've edited the sky, before, after. Tip number two is get to know your object select tool in masks. Object select is really useful, sometimes when you don't expect it to be. So looking at this image of a black shouldered kite, we want to select the bird. So the obvious mask to use is select subject. When we do that, you can see if we zoom in a little, there are some areas, especially around the talons, that are really not very good. Whereas if you had used the object select, And you don't have to be particularly precise with this tool at all. Big brush, as you can see. And I'm just selecting everything that is part of the bird.
And so that's mask three. We'll zoom in again. And you can see the difference between mask two and those areas of red between the talons. And mask three, the select object, is much cleaner, much cleaner indeed. So, object select, really handy tool, sometimes when you don't expect it. So we'll move straight into tip number three. Tip number three is about intersecting masks. It's a super powerful tool that can be used in a number of scenarios. In this case, I've selected the entire bird using the object select tool as you just saw. And what I want to do is really emphasize the dark parts of its wing. Well, if I do that, if I increase the contrast, then it's going to impact the entire bird, which is not what I want. So rather, I'll go into my mask, click on the three dots, and I'm going to intersect my mask with a luminance range. Before I do that, you've got all of these options to intersect the mask with a whole range of different options. So I urge you to experiment with those. But in this case, luminance range, and I want the darker areas, but not the very darkest areas. And you can see that initially it's selecting everything in the image, but when I come down to the mask, it's removing the lightest areas, and now I can adjust. And they're the areas that I want to select. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna raise the shadows in those areas a little, bring down the black slightly, and then I'm going to raise the texture, draw attention to those black components of the wing. There we are. The intersect tool in masks. Tip number four, go solo. Let's look at the next image. This is a warbler in amongst the reeds, and I've done a lot of work on this edit. So I've been in pretty much all of the panels, and you can see there are a lot of panels. Now, the problem is when you get down to one of these in the lower end, so you're just adjusting the sharpening or what have you, and now you wanna go back and make a quick change to the tone, so you wanna just adjust the exposure. It's a bit of a faff and you can't see exactly where you're at and which tabs are open. So, go solo. Just find one of these dark areas where the headings are and right click and then click on solo mode. And what solo mode does is it closes all of the panels apart from the specific one that you're in. So in this case, I'm now in basic panel. If I want to go to my color mixer, then it shuts the basic panel for me and opens the color mixer, allowing me to do the edit that I want to do very quickly and easily without getting lost amongst all the panels. That's tip number four. Go solo. Tip number five is to be pedantic. Be pedantic with the spot removal tool. This image of lesser flamingos taken at Maryville Bird Sanctuary in South Africa. It's a really nice image, great reflection. Spent a lot of time editing this image, but there's a number of distractions. So I'm gonna go into the spot removal tool and I'm gonna work on it. Now I'm gonna speed up this part of the video and then we'll come back and see the difference. And I think I'm happy with that. So not one of those elements that I removed on their own was majorly distracting, but collectively, I think they detracted from the overall image. Let me show you, click on this little eye at the bottom, and there's all of the distractions back. That's with them removed, that's before removal, and you can see collectively, they really grab the eye which you may not have noticed when you first looked at the image, but certainly subconsciously it's there. 
causing your eye to move away from the main focus of the image. So tip number five is to be pedantic with that spot removal tool. Don't waste all of that time you've spent editing the image for distractions to remain. Tip number six is to use vignettes, but don't use the vignette tool. Looking at this image from a hotel in France, uh, I really like the black and white edit, but I don't like this section around the right hand side and even this section here, uh, which I think is too bright and distracting. So Lightroom has under the effects a vignetting tool and it does a job, but it's a pretty blunt instrument. Now there is some flexibility, you can change midpoints and you can change the roundness of the vignette. But again, I still don't think it gives you the flexibility that we really want. So let's undo that and use a mask. And in this case, it's the easiest mask there is probably. And that's the radial gradient. And so you can put the radial gradient wherever you want it to be, extend it to whichever size you want. And I don't want a full circle because I want it to affect the right and the left hand side of the image more than the top and the bottom. And then I'm going to invert that and then apply my adjustments, reduction in exposure, big reduction in highlights and in whites, really drag that down a little, bring the blacks down as well, crushing those, which in this case I'm quite comfortable with, and then I can just adjust that accordingly. And I'm going to change the feather. And there's the before, and there's the after much better effect than with the vignetting tool built into the effects panel. So tip number seven, it's all about preserving your colors when adjusting the contrast with the tone curve. So wherever possible, I would avoid using the contrast slider as a global adjustment. There's just not much control there. Whereas in the tone curve, you can control where on the histogram you're adjusting the luminance. So in this case, I want a relatively simple S curve. I'm going to bring down the blacks quite a lot. And then raise the highlights, not too much. That's okay. So I'm quite happy with the contrast that we now have across the image. Well, what I'm not happy with, if we click on the before and after of the tone curve, notice it's not just the adjustment to the contrast. The other thing that's been affected significantly is the saturation of the colors. Now I want to control my colors the way I want to control my colors great little feature that's come into Lightroom recently is that when you're using the tone curve to adjust the contrast you've got this refined saturation slider. Now personally I always move that all the way across to the left because I'll adjust the colors separately but you can if you like a particular point on the spectrum you could leave it some way across that scale and in fact I quite like it there at around 35, 37. But the point is, don't use the contrast slider in the basic panel for global contrast adjustments, in my opinion. Better to use the tone curve, but when you're using the tone curve and the contrast slider as well, that will affect the saturation in your colors. Within the tone curve, you've got this refined saturation slider which means that you can adjust or remove that adjustment to your colors. That's tip number seven, and I promised you seven. However, 
there is a bonus tip, and this tip is the killer tip. This is bonus tip, tip number eight, and this is super powerful. And it's a feature in Lightroom that I just don't see being used very often, and it's so incredibly useful. This is snapshots. So this image of flamingos taken at Maryvale Bird Sanctuary, again, uh, here in South Africa, beautiful image. And I've spent a lot of time working on this image, getting it to be how I want it to be. And I really like the image, but I think it might look quite nice as a black and white image. So if I change that to black and white, no, I quite like it, but I'm going to need to make some adjustments. Now, if I start making adjustments randomly, just to show you the principles here, then you can see that as I make those changes, some of them are dreadful changes, I grant you. But as I make those changes, my history is building. And now I have a choice. What if I like this image, but I also like the color image? Or what if I want to go back to the color image and change something? Now I can go back into history, of course, but there's a much easier way of doing these things. So let me just click undo on all of these and we'll go back to the images we started. I move up to snapshots and I click the plus and it creates a snapshot of where I am. And I'm just going to call this for now color. Create. Now I can convert to black and white. Now I can make the adjustments, whichever adjustments I want. So I'm going to adjust the one of the masks. And for speed, I'm just going to make a few almost random adjustments here, just to demonstrate what I mean. So I've made some adjustments. Let's assume I'm happy with this black and white image now, but I want to revert to color and make some adjustments to the color version. If I undo, that's going to create problems. It's going to, I'm going to lose track of where I am amongst this long history of adjustments that I've made to the image. So, I'm going to create another snapshot and call it black and white. And now I can flick between. So now within my color image, just want to reduce the saturation a little more than I have already and the vibrance. And let's change that to color less saturation. Now I have three snapshots I can move between very easily. I can move between those and make adjustments without trying to work out where I am. Super powerful, really worth experimenting with. And it means you don't have to keep creating virtual copies. You can just create a snapshot. So it's all within the same image. And then you can move to whichever snapshot you're interested in and export that image with those adjustments only. Give it a try. There we are. Seven tips and tricks for you to try in Adobe Lightroom. It may be that you've come across some of them before, but at least this is a refresher. And hopefully at least one or two of them are brand new to you and you can go and experiment and try those different techniques. I hope you found the video useful and interesting. I'd love to hear your comments. Drop me a note below. I read every single comment we get and I respond to as many as I possibly can. Really appreciate you joining. Until the next time, take care. Bye bye.